What is your special cooking secrets that few people know? Story 1. I use better than bouillon to add flavor to many of the dishes I make. I keep jars of the chicken, beef, and veggie flavors in the fridge to use as needed. I use the beef flavor in pretty much anything that has ground beef. A tablespoon per pound when cooking the meat gives it so much more flavor than using just salt. If you're cooking a Latin American dish, add Mexican oregano. It's different from your usual oregano, and it the flavor profile is earthy, warm, and slightly spicy. If you want to eat sauerkraut and you're an American, rinse your kraut first. Our kraut in America is way over vinegarated compared to the real German stuff. I have plenty more too, and a trained professional baker and I love to cook. So if you have questions for your baked goods, please feel free to ask. Story 5. Cottage Cheese and Pancake Batter my late grandfather always did this and his pancakes were the absolute best. It doesn't taste or feel like cottage cheese, but it makes the pancakes fluffy and gives a bit of delightful creaminess. I have extremely fond memories of being young and having breakfast at my grandparents' house where his pancakes were the main attraction. Story 6. 35 years in the restaurant biz. Prep, patience, and timing. Few people realize how much time restaurants spend in prep. Prep as much as you possibly can ahead of time. It will make things go so much easier. Be patient with your cooking. If you get in a hurry, things can go south really fast. Low and slow is usually better depending on the recipe. And be realistic about how much time things take. Good example is bacon. I never fry it. I bake it in the oven on a cookie sheet with foil. Takes longer but comes out evenly cooked. And most importantly, I don't have to stand over it pretty constantly. Story 7. When whipping cream, add a tiny bit of lemon juice to help keep it from softening. Also add some lemon juice to the water if cooking slightly browned cauliflower to whiten it. Add a little bicarb to the water when blanching broccoli to keep it nicely green. Never add salt to a pan of cooking food until all ingredients have absorbed the water that they need to. Salt sucks water out of ingredients like beans, etc. The semi-permeable membrane effect. Story 2. Okay. This is coming from a professional chef who specializes in baking, so listen up. If you cook anything cake-like and the ridge of the pan is higher than what the thing rose to, then you can add a layer of icing immediately after it comes out of the oven. Yes, it'll melt. But then the texture will change to a midway point between ganache and normal icing after it's cooled back down again. Also, the seal it creates is so strong that it preserves the moisture of the thing underneath. Perfect for making brownies that aren't hard as rocks, like most people's. Especially because, after they've cooled, if you cut the brownies up, wrap them individually in plastic wrap, and then freeze them, then they'll have retained enough moisture and crumbliness to end up with a taste and texture that's nearly indistinguishable from an ice cream sandwich. Try it if you don't believe me. Great fresh pasta is so, so easy and cheap to make. Two cups of plain flour, three eggs at room temperature, a dash of olive oil. You can go fancier if you want, but this is all you need. Knead into a ball. Cover and let sit till you are ready to go. I use a pasta mill, but you can roll it out flat. Fold it. Roll again. Repeat a few times until it is smooth and creamy opaque. Then slice it into strips for lovely fettuccine or keep it wider for lasagna. Go have a play with this and you'll be making your own custom tortellinis in no time. Story 8. To separate a yolk. Keep passing it to and from each half of the broken shell until the white drains away. Chicken thighs are way cheaper and often taste better. Even cheaper if you know how to debone. More butter equal sign more better. Don't use flour to thicken something after it's done cooking. It'll just make it gluey and bloat you. Use cornstarch slurry. If your sauce has split, just add a little water. The secret to crunchy roast potatoes. Parboil them with a little baking soda and then toss them so at the surface gets all fluffy. Then cover in oil and roast them. Story 9. Not really a secret, but I'll tell you everything my dad has taught me. Buy yeast on Etsy or another website. It is cheap and making your own bread or pizza dough is easy. Edit. Whoops meant sourdough starter. Gardening. Also cheap and I still have herbs hanging in my kitchen on twine, and I'm using some of them to make Christmas gifts because I'm not working right now. You can also dry stuff like long beans and persimmons. Story 3. When I cook pasta, I boil water in barely enough water to cover the pasta, and I use correspondingly less salt. But I stir it for the first couple of minutes to prevent the pasta from sticking together. I do this because the resulting pasta water is really starchy, 
and this starchy pasta water works great for thickening sauces and emulsifying oil-based sauces. You can rehydrate a baguette by getting it super wet and putting it in the oven for 10-ish minutes at 350, but you need to watch it. If you're making ramen and have a water boiler or a second pot, boil the noodles and dump the water and make a lil second bowl ready while cooking. That has the sauces and add water as needed. I usually use part of the packet, soy, miso, sesame oil, and fish sauce. It's super easy to cook asparagus in foil on the grill, and the best marinade is oyster sauce, sriracha, and garlic. If you want to poach an egg without it foaming up, apple cider vinegar can help. That's all I can think of. Also, bacon pancakes rule. See Adventure Time. Story 10. To get chicken skin crispy, scald it with boiling water. This actually works, even if you follow the scalding step with a wet cooking method such as sous vide. Even after a wet cooking method, just pat the skin dry, and dry heat such as searing on a pan or roasting in an oven will cause the skin to crisp up. Here's the video I learned it from. Sous vide everything vertical bar. This method was apparently developed by Chinese restaurants that have those crispy skin-roasted ducks. Something about scalding the skin causes the fat under the skin to render out more thoroughly and causes the skin to crisp up under dry heat. The scalding causes the skin to contract and tighten up. I think that the proteins in the skin squeeze out water when they contract, and this may have something to do with why this helps with crisping. Here's how I do this scalding trick on a whole chicken. I salt the chicken under the skin or eye, and then I put the chicken on a cookie cooling rack over the sink and pour boiling water all over it using a pour-over kettle. Then I flip the bird over and scald the back. See this demonstrated in this gallery? Boiling your pasta in much less water also means the water comes to a boil much faster because there's less of it to boil. Here are some experiments I did on trying to achieve super crispy skin on chicken. Edit. You may have noticed that the chickens shown in these galleries are not trussed with string. I use a stringless truss method, which complements this scalding method because the scalding shrinks the skin, which by default acts like trussing. Here's how to do it, demonstrated in this video of a Korean food stall that does rotisserie chicken. Story 11. I have a method for making mashed potatoes that takes less effort, because there's no peeling involved, and yields fantastic results. Easy mashed potatoes method. Wash your potatoes and cut them into chunks, eight pieces per potato should suffice, and rinse off the starch from the cut surfaces. Then pressure steam the potato chunks in an electric pressure cooker, such as the Instant Pot with their skins on. The only thing you might want to do before this is to cut out any bruises and discolored spots and any eyes that show signs of sprouting. 12 minutes of pressure steaming, followed by 10 minutes of natural release, and they're ready to be mashed. When you pressure steam stuff, you only need a little bit of water covering the bottom of the pot. Three cups to one quart of water suffices, so it comes to a boil really quickly. I use a steaming rack to hold the potatoes off the bottom of the pot. I don't want the potatoes to be waterlogged, and pressure steaming is perfect for avoiding waterlogged potatoes. Then, in a bowl, I dissolve some salt into warmed-up heavy whipping cream for the most even salt distribution, and I use a potato ricer to press the pressure-steamed potatoes into the bowl. Place the steamed potato chunks skin-side up into the ricer before pressing them through. The skins won't go through the perforated plate, so they can be picked off easily. Then, gently stir the pressed potato into the salted cream until everything is smooth. This method is super fast because pressure steaming just goes way faster than boiling the potatoes since there's minimal water to bring to a boil, while the cooking temperature is something like 240 tais in a pressure cooker. And the no-peel ricer trick is much less labor-intensive than peeling all the potatoes and mashing the by hand. On multiple occasions, this method let me make mashed potatoes where the traditional method would not have fit my limited time available. Story 12. I have a few hacks for making Hasselback potatoes better and faster. For some of my pasta dishes, I cook the pasta risotto style, pasta risotata, where all the pasta water gets absorbed or boiled off. The resulting concentration of starch is particularly useful for emulsifying in oils. I do spaghetti aglio e olio this way, and it turns out great. I use mini potatoes for this, about the size of eggs. After cutting the cuts into the back of the potato, I roll the potatoes over a steel straw to open up the cracks just a bit, and I sprinkle coarse black pepper or granulated garlic, 
or whatever granulated seasoning blend I was intending to use, over the potatoes. The granules fall into the cracks and hold them open. Then I rub the potatoes with compound butter or a flavored olive oil, being sure to rub the butter or oil into the cuts and place them in a brazier or a Dutch oven and bake them at 400 F, 205 PC with the lid on for half an hour. When the potatoes bake with the lid on, the trapped steam helps cook them through substantially faster than if you were to bake them the whole time uncovered. Then I remove the lid, butter them up some more, and bake for another half an hour to 45 minutes, and then they're ready to serve. I top them with homemade sour cream and onion and crispy toasted breadcrumbs for some texture. Story 13. Took a cooking class with a chef who worked for the U.S. Olympic team at the Beijing Games. His instructions for pasta. Salt the hell out of the pasta water. It should taste like seawater. The pasta will absorb some of that salt and taste amazing. Don't bother with oil in the pot. The oil will float on top and not touch the pasta anyway. Reserve a splash of pasta water for the sauce. It helps thicken it. But since it's super salty, plan the salt in the sauce accordingly. Don't oil the pasta. You want the sauce to stick to the pasta, and it'll slide right off if you use oil. Select a good quality olive oil for a finishing touch. Good quality olive oil will taste grassy and peppery in the back of your throat. Story 14. Do not throw away chicken skin. Air fry it until crispy to make pork rinds but chicken. Learn a roux. Oil and flour heated and browned to cook your vegetables in. When water is added to this and brought to a boil and let to cool, it will thicken into a delicious sauce. This what gravy mixes do, powder plus boiling water. This is the basis for many, many traditional foods, especially ones that go over rice. Gumbo, jambalaya, shrimp etouffe, Indian butter chicken, etc. You can cook a meal for 100 with enough rice and a good roux. I'm pretty sure Jesus could have served those 5,000 people some gumbo and had leftovers after. Story 15. Level 1 of learning to make food good is the salt-slash-acid-slash-fat-slash-heat level. Level 2 is cold and air and time. Make the chocolate chip cookie recipe you think is good, but cream the butter and sugar until it's fluffy and has completely changed color. Air and time. As soon as your baked goods are room temperature or cool enough to handle, wrap them airtight and freeze them. As baked good cool, they lose moisture that you cannot bring back properly. But if you can flash freeze, you trap the moisture. It's why those wedding box cakes are good. They bake it and then freeze it. Always freeze berries you want to make into a pie. Freezing water makes it expand and it will rupture the little cells and your pies will be juicier. Spices develop over time. That's why the recipe says to chill your gingerbread dough overnight. If you need to make things quicker, you can bloom the spices in fat like you would to make a curry. Some chemical reactions cause delicious flavor. And your goal when baking is to optimize this reaction without getting side reactions that taste bad. If you are trying to caramelize something, don't heat it past the reaction temp range and let it stay there for long enough that the reaction can happen. Low and slow. Overproofed dough is just yeast that ate all their snacks. Punch down, feed them a little snack of some sugar and have at it. Story 16. Roast your canned diced tomatoes on a baking sheet. Slow and low concentrates the sugars and evaporates most of the liquid. A bit hotter, and you start to get a nice little bit of char, which adds complexity. This absolutely will elevate your soup, sauce, and chili game. Story 4. If you're baking and want something to be really tender but stable, like a cake, try reverse creaming. Instead of creaming your butter and sugar and then adding in ingredients, add your softened butter, or shortening or what have you, to your flour mixture first. Essentially, it limits the development of the gluten, which is what can make baked goods tough. It's a good way to closely mimic store-bought mixes while still being homemade. Add herbs like thyme or rosemary early, like after sautéing the onions garlic, but before adding other ingredients. This will allow them to bloom and release more flavor. Buy a decent microplane and use the hell out of it. Orange or lemon zest works in a whole lot more recipes than people think, and can give you a signature style with a little practice. Also, if you have the time, grate that garlic. Story 17. I take some dried mushrooms and gently pulse them in a coffee grinder I use only for things other than coffee, and combine them 50-50 with coarse sea salt, my favorite is Himalayan pink salt, and put this in a salt grinder. 
When I use salt for cooking savory dishes, I grind this into what I'm cooking to add both salt and umami. I also grow my own fresh herbs. You can also buy them. And while they are still fresh, toss them in a bowl with the same coarse salt and leave them out to dry out in the salt. The salt causes the herbs to sweat out the moisture and all the flavors are absorbed by the salt. I stir this every once in a while while this dries out. It takes about a week. And when it is all dry, I out it in a salt grinder and grind this into food I am cooking or even use it as a table salt. The herbal flavors add a wonderful extra nuance to whatever you are salting. You can do this with either individual herbs or combine several together. For example, I will combine fresh oregano, basil, parsley, thyme, sage, and rosemary for an Italian herb mixture. Story 18. Fine, I'll give you my secret to perfect French fries. Cut potatoes and wash, agitate and submerge ice-cold water, dumping and repeating until the water runs clear. This removes starch and will make your fries extremely tasty and crisp. Pre-cook the fries in peanut oil, or your oil of choice, I prefer peanut, preheated to 350-375F. This is best done with a basket setup because you're going to need to lift, shake, and submerge again regularly, every 15 seconds. Keep an eye on them because this stage is important. This helps the fries cook evenly without being stuck together and gives them a break from the hot oil. Pre-cook takes about two, three minutes. After pre-cooking, let them cool for about 15 minutes until the inside of the potatoes has steamed and they look slightly translucent and a pale golden color. No crispy or golden brown yet. If they are, your oil is too hot or you cooked them too long. After the potatoes are squishy to the touch and cooled to room temp, submerge in oil again, repeating the same process as before. Some prefer to raise the temp of their oil to around 400, 425 here, but I find that unnecessary as adding another variable like oil temp change makes it easier to fuck up. Lift and shake fries every 20, 30 seconds until the edges of the fries are a deep orange and the rest of the fries are golden brown. Salt while hot and fresh. Crispy AF outside, full fluffy mashed potato inside. If making bread from scratch, always knead the dough. It's super easy to over knead with mixers. You can sense when your dough is actually ready by hand instead of guessing. Makes a world of difference. The amount of cooking videos I've seen on YouTube where the creator has an otherwise great video, yet fucks up the fries, has me so annoyed. I'm just some 30-year-old white dude with no restaurant experience past five guys when I was 19 years old. Hell, even five guys employees fuck up the fries nine, ten times, as do most restaurants. But I made those fries my pride and joy for the year I worked there. Was constantly told by regular customers that my fries were the best. Story 19. Salt, fat, acid, and heat. These are the secrets to making something taste amazing with minimal effort or spices. Salt enhances the taste of meats and vegetables and complements them in its own right. Salt meats as early as possible, even overnight if you can. Salt vegetables later during the cooking process. Fat adds mouthfeel and carries flavor while cooking. It can be a heat medium during the cooking process and allows for cooking that is both fast and flavorful. If your meats are dry, add some fats. When baking, Fats are a key component of texture. Acid brightens flavor. If your meal is well salted but tastes bland, try adding a little bit of acid. A twist of lemon juice over some steamed vegetables, tomato paste in a stew, or wine in a pan can add incredible depth where there was none before. Heat is complex and will largely be tied to the recipe in question. In meats, low temps for long times can allow fat to render out and makes tough cuts tender. High heat can provide a crispy texture and complex flavors. Water is essential for temperature control. If your vegetables are burning in the pan, add some water to lower the temperature. In all cases, taste your food as soon as you safely can, and do it often. If it's not delicious, adjust one of the above four until it is. If you want to learn more, I highly recommend the book Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. It's been my Bible, and it's made my cooking ten times better. Another baking tip. Have a spray bottle of just water on hand to squirt into your oven before putting in your baked goods. The added moisture almost always improves the texture. 